It's like sky dust has been sprinkled on this little jewel. But not only that, evolution has bedecked it with silver sequins which stud its dainty wings. Surely that can't be topped, but it can. When those wings open, it shimmers in burnished blue, splits the spectrum, sparks the sun, and becomes a natural treasure. Sometimes, the little things mean most of all. Welcome to Springwatch. Hello. Hello! Welcome to Spring Watch 2023, coming to you again on another sunny, beautiful evening at RSPB Arn in Dorset. Look at it. Oh, has that ever happened for the first two weeks of Spring Watch? But we've still got jackets well, on. Well, you have, yeah. Because there's a nip overdressed. in the air. A, a nip in the air. We've got a cracking show coming up tonight, I've got to say. We've been principally concentrating up until now on some of the specialists on Sandy Lowland Heath, but there are plenty of other habitats here. We've got some woodland. In fact, we've got ancient woodland here. Oak, birch, some pine woodlands as well, and some of the species that we find there. Today, we spotted a spotted flycatcher, a bird that's become quite rare. There's some relict farmland, which is overgrown now and filled with beautiful buttercups. And I've got to say, some fantastic heathland pools. And these places are an absolute magnet for predators like these beautiful dragonflies. And I'm going to be exploring one of those pools a bit later in the programme, looking for an aquatic monster, an absolute monster. We've got three new live nests. We've got some avian superstars, there's no doubt about that. And there's every chance that I could be bitten by an aquatic assassin live on air. <laughs> but before all that, let's catch up with our live nests. What's been happening over the last 24 hours? You can see there's plenty of movement because we've got plenty of chicks. What about our nightjar, though? Nightjar patiently sitting on her nest. We left her with two eggs that she was brooding. So what's happened in the last 24 hours for her? Look at this. There she is. As I say, every time we go to her, she's just there on the nest. But look at that eye and look at that head. It's like oh, robot nightjar. So it's, weird. It's, it's like so it's weird. remote control. But look at what's been happening over the last four nights. This is what we've noticed, that the male hasn't been coming in. And previously to that, every night, the male would come in, sometimes very briefly, but just take over the nest and give her a break. And we've not seen him for four nights in a row. So we started to get a little bit concerned because once those eggs hatch and the chicks come out, then he will have a bigger role. So if he disappeared, what would happen? Well, look at what happened last night because I'm very pleased to tell you he showed up. There he is, you can see the flash of white under his wings, so that's the male. He comes to the female sitting on the nest and then they do this bonding dance, wagging their tails. And then if you listen, you can hear the churring. It's a sort of purring, churring noise. And then he took over, sat on the eggs very briefly, I mean, literally for about four minutes. But the good news is he was back. But why would he have disappeared and then come back again? Well, if I show you what happened this morning, I think it gives us a clue because there she is sitting on the nest, but look what's underneath her, a brand newly hatched chick. Literally just come out, there's the egg. Well, this looks a bit comical, doesn't it? When they pick them up in their beak like that, doesn't know what to do with it, uh, drops it and it hits the chick on the head. <laughs> so there's the chick, I mean it's still damp so you know that it's just come out. It snuggles under her warm breast to keep warm and look at that, just a few hours later, this was today, it's dried off and it's looking all fluffy. And we know there's another egg underneath her and so we're keeping our fingers crossed that we will see two chicks, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. Who what knows? You really love nightjars, don't you? What a bird, the nightjar. 
Is it because they have that sort of neck that looks like it's going to go all well, the way around? basically weird. You always want to see more of them. Without our cameras, you don't get to get a, a real insight into their lives. They're an enigmatic, charismatic, oh, filmatic, everything <laughs> attic. To top that, we're going to need a, a real trouser stroker of a bird. So what could we possibly come up with? <laughs> Let's go live to the goshawk. Oh, yes. Imagine a goshawk eating a nightjar. No, let's not oh, imagine that. Oh, sorry. It. OK, I don't know why that came out. It, it, it erased that, expunged that from the broadcast. Look, here we are. We've got these youngsters. There are three youngsters in the nest. There are two large individuals and one smaller one, the one that's covered in down on the left-hand side. Can't see it quite so clearly there. But we've been watching them, of course, throughout the course of... Oh, a bit of a call. Hold on, hold on. Let's hang on. This could be the adult coming in. Let's just hang on. They've obviously heard something. Will she or he come in with food? They've been alerted, and this is typically what happens. Oh, they're looking up. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Bring something in. Not a nightjar. Don't bring a nightjar in, please. Whatever happens now. <laughs> OK. Maybe the, suspense the other... suspense is killing us. Yes, oh, yes. Oh, come on, come on, gossip. No, they've lost interest. They've lost interest. OK, we'll go back to it if the uh, adult does appear. But we've been watching them throughout the course of the day, of course. Now, what we think is going on here is that we have two females, the larger birds, and a smaller male. And there's also asynchronous hatching taking place. Because the males are considerably smaller. They can be half the weight of a female goshawk at their maximum discrepancy. But look, the little male there on the left-hand side, he's getting stuck in. He's not getting bullied by his bigger sisters. There's no question. Tug of war for the food. Typical goshawk. Ferocious, furious and fierce. Adult leaves, and they have started to now peck at the food themselves. They're not reliant on those adults to tear it up for them. But look, He's got his eye on it. He fancies a little bit of a snack. He's slightly intimidated by his larger sister, who uh, gives him a look and then kung fu's him in the face. We've all been there. But, frankly, he doesn't give up, and when she's had her fill, he goes back, states his claim vocally, and then takes that piece of meat away and, again, practises te tearing that up. Now, we think they're about 25 days old, so they've still got plenty of time in this nest, but already you can see their wing stretching, a bit of wing exercise, even the little guy's doing that, and the feathers are beginning to come through. I think he's got to be my favourite chick because he's feisty and I just love those fluffy trousers. There's something wonderfully comical about him. I know, what a start, though. Nightjar and goshawk. How can you possibly top that? Well, I'm going to give you something beautiful and something colourful. I'm going to give you... This, it's the silver studded blue butterfly. Look at that, what a stunner. Now these are rare, mainly found in heathlands. The males have that incredible silvery blue wing, absolutely beautiful. The females, a little bit duller I'm afraid, brown with that orange stripe on their wings. Soon as the females come out, then the male will start to mate. And you can see you've got a mating pair here, the silver blue male and the brown female. And that mating seems to attract a lot of the other males around and they come and they investigate and they flutter. And they, well, let's face it, I mean, the original pair have to hang on tight because it looks like they're trying to dislodge the male off and mate the female themselves. Superb, Interesting. Isn't it? Superb. Do you know sometimes those female silver studded blues can emerge from their pupae and before they've even extended and dried off their wings, one of those males is mating with them straight away. It's what you call keen. It is keen. And then you get these, these mating swarms taking place with all of them fluttering around. I mean, imagine being in amongst that. I'd rather not. No, probably not. <laughs> Megs, we've started strong here with some avian A-listers and a mating swarm. What can you possibly do to match that? Oh. Right, well, you might have some good birds and you might have some good insects, but tonight I am queen of the fish and I'm still here at Studland Bay. This is where I am, just on this peninsula here, part, of course, the super national nature reserve at Purbeck Heath. It's a fantastic area. If you look to this side, I have Old Harry Rocks. And if you look on this side, I've got the South Beach. But right in the middle there is a really critically important sea grass bed. It's 
very shallow, it's very sheltered, but it is ecologically incredibly important and it's all to do with climate change. So while seagrass only covers about 0.2% of the ocean seabed, it actually accounts for 10%, 10% of all carbon sequestration. So it takes that carbon out of the ocean and locks it down in the seabed. It's a really critically important habitat. And I haven't even touched on the biodiversity that lives there. And on that bay over there are two UK species of seahorses. The only two we've got, we've got the short snouted seahorse and then the spiny seahorse, the spiky seahorse. And this is the one that I'm particularly interested in. Now the spiky seahorse is rather adorable. You can see the spikes on it there. The spines on there, sorry, the spines on it there. And it is really rather lovely, but this bay is the only bay where they are known to breed. So it's really critically important of the whole of the UK that it is protected. Now, spiny seahorses and all seahorses are really interesting animals. They've got amazing adaptations. So one of those examples is the fact that their caudal tail, which is something all fish have, and seahorses are fish, is that it doesn't really exist in the typical way a fish tail is. It's this prehensile tail that they're able to wrap around the seagrass, and it enables them to stay camouflaged. So as the current comes and they rock to and fro in the current, they're able to stay really camouflaged. They've then got two eyes that move independently of each other. It means that they can detect prey and also watch out for predators at the same time. But the most fascinating adaptation that I find interesting is the way that they reproduce. Now, what happens here is that the male and female will come together. They will entwine those prehensile tails, still staying lodged on the seagrass. And um, the female will transfer, deposit her eggs into a male brood pouch. Now, this brood pouch essentially acts like a pseudo placenta and he fertilizes those eggs and then keeps them really safe. He provides them with enough oxygen as well as enough nutrients for them to grow. And they are really incredible. I mean, it's the only male really that I know of that goes through essentially a kind of pseudo pregnancy. And if you look here, the young are coming out of that pouch. Now they'll emerge about three to four weeks after fertilization, but they're so tiny and so cute. My goodness, I would love to see a tiny spiny seahorse like that. It totally melts my heart. But of course, this area, as I said, is critically important, not just here across the Supernational Nature Reserve, but across the UK, because very sadly, we've lost about 91% of all seagrass habitat, which is catastrophic for climate change, but also for these amazing animals as well. Now, in the summer, lots of boats come here and it is a very beautiful area, so you can understand why. But they come to this area, up to 200 boats, and they drop anchor. Now, let me show you what happens when the anchor drops. And here, I've got my anchor, it's come into the sea ground. And I've got my seagrass, which is actually seaweed, but imagine it's seagrass. And what happens then is this comes around like this and it destroys years and years of growth of the seabed. And as storms come and the chain moves around, very sadly, it destroys that habitat. So what happens? Well, the Seahorse Trust, as well as other partners, have come together in 2021 to put these things out into the ocean. Now, these are eco-mooring uh, stations, and essentially what happens is the boat comes up, they attach onto the top of the buoy, this buoy sits on the top of the water, and then below we get further, deeper down, you've got these buoys which lift up the heavy chain bit, then you've got this flexible rubber area which gives the boat any movement if it needs in a storm, and then you have this long, area as well which essentially acts as a screw and it's screwed into the seabed and this is really critically important because it doesn't damage the seagrass as much let me show you how that works so here i've got my eco mooring section and if it moves in the storm like this well you can see there is no damage to the seagrass at all something really important and something we can all remember especially boat owners if you're coming to this area look out for eco mooring to protect this critically important habitat and those gorgeous seahorses as well. Now let's head up to North Wales where Gillian is. Gillian, I believe you're also on a gorgeous beach. I certainly am. I am on the absolutely beautiful Clean Peninsula, another beautiful Welsh location. We are journeying on, we're carrying on our tour through North Wales. Last night we were up on the Menai Strait and as beautiful as that was, we have headed south, we've headed west onto that narrow strip of land that juts out into the North Sea, the Clean Peninsula. And it's our first view of the open ocean behind us and what a view that is and what an evening to be here as well. It's absolutely beautiful. Now we're on a beach called Porth Nigel, which 
out overlooks the bay. It's called Hell's Mouth Bay. Very fitting because this bay faces the southwest. It's a southwesterly facing bay and it takes the prevailing weather, the wind, the waves. And this aspect means that it creates these really strong currents that sometimes in the past have taken many a ship, they've claimed many a ship. So it doesn't just affect shipping, it affects the landscape. So you've had some geography, you've had some history, a little bit of weather. Let's dig in to some geology because this is why we're here. It's this formation, which is actually a very scarce formation around the UK coast, but here in Wales, they have more their, their fair share. And I love it when scientists name things and tell you exactly what it is. It's soft cliff. Now let's take a closer look at this. It's crumbly, it's fragile, but the structure is stabilized by pioneering grasses and scrub. And if you look at those root systems there, knitting it all together, they allow a succession of colonizing species to take hold and species like bird's foot trefoil, really important, those yellow flowers providing nectar for all sorts of flying insects at this time of year, but also the leaves are really important larval food plants. So lots of insects start to do well in this kind of habitat. Now there's one species that is found nowhere else in the country except for two sites on the Hleen Peninsula, and that's the large mason bee. They're beautiful little things. Now large mason bees use this structure to excavate and to construct their nests. And you can see as the bee pops its little head there, it's a really fine sandy structure, individual sand grains there caught on the hairs, hairs called CT. And it looks like it's a little bit dazed there in the sunlight, but it flies off. So I'm joined with a geoscientist, someone who can really tell us about this formation, Dr. Linda York from Bangor University. Linda, thank you for joining us this evening. So just give me an idea of what these layers are. What are we looking at here? So what you've got to imagine is 25,000 years ago, all of this area was under ice. And what you've got at the bottom sequence here, this clay stony material is the stuff that was dumped underneath the ice. But obviously once the ice age started to end and it melting away, you've got these kind of rivers of sands and gravels. And they're the bits the bees really like because they're well drained. And then right at the very top, you've really got sort of blown sand, sand dune formation. That's probably only about 4,000 years old. So we've got a really sort of long time sequence. Layers in time. So yeah, you can really see that sandy structure there. Is it fair to say that this soft cliff, if nothing else changes, will eventually become rock, sandstone rock? It would, yeah. It would eventually sort of lithify and become solid if it stayed here. If it stays. But I know <laughs> the wind, the weather. How long is this habitat going to be available for species like the large mason bee? Well, the thing is here, you get those big southwesterly storms coming in and the sea is basically eating away at the clay. The cliffs are collapsing. So it probably won't last too much longer. I mean, maybe in another 10, 20,000 years, it <gasps> won't be here. So it's quite short. It's a blink of wow. an eye. So, yeah, a blink of the yeah, maybe in geological terms, but certainly not for humans. Thank you so much, Linda. Well, a fleeting, a transient landscape for species like the large mason bee. But later on in the program, we're going to be looking at another species that comes here for this amazing habitat. Now, these are superstars. They're absolutely fantastic. They are the sand martens. We are going to be looking at these later on and featuring how they use this incredible habitat for their breeding. Now, we're going to leave the Welsh beach, we're going to leave the sunshine as we join Chantal Lindsay, and she's going to be taking us into a Victorian world where a mysterious creature lurks. Highgate Cemetery gives me Gothic. It gives me Dracula. But also, there's something majestic about it. Since 1839, this cemetery has been a Victorian monument to the dead. But amongst these graves, there's life waiting to be found. It's a quiet and peaceful sanctuary, away from the bustle of the surrounding city. And these graves and stone walls provide the perfect hiding places for some of our smaller cast of characters. 
When you take a closer look around the cemetery, you start to see the invertebrates. We've got our wood lice over here, and these ones are tucked away because it's early spring, quite cold. There are aggregations of ladybirds. And there have even been 85 species of spider recorded in the cemetery. But there's one arachnid you won't find out here in the open. In fact, these spiders are looking for a far more niche habitat. And this ancient burial site, home to 16 dark sealed tombs, seems to offer them just what they need. We've been given special access to enter this vault. Thankfully, there aren't any human remains inside, but there is an orb-weaving spider I'm particularly keen to see. It's a cave spider, Meta Vornetti. It's a species that goes largely unseen because of their preference for dark habitats like underground caves. But cemetery vaults seem to replicate the perfect conditions for them. With low light levels and relatively constant humidity and temperatures. And this is it absolutely stunning. It's this gorgeous deep brown colour. It was first discovered here 10 years ago by an entomologist and they're pretty big. With its legs outstretched, it's about the size of the palm of my hand. From what we have observed so far, all the individuals in this tomb right now are females. One theory that the experts have is that the females are eating the males after breeding, which is why they're not around in the spring. Their orb web acts as a weapon to trap their prey. But at this time of the year, the females also use their silk for a more tender purpose. Now this is an egg sac, and it's made out of woven silk. The females carefully craft their egg sacs in autumn, and the young survive on nutrients provided by the yolk until they're ready to emerge in spring. Each egg sac can hold up to 200 eggs. And right now, they're starting to hatch. And you can see over here, the spiderlings are starting to make their way out. Considering their parents' penchant for dark, dank caves, these youngsters are doing something rather remarkable. Adult spiders exhibit a negative form of phototaxis, meaning that they prefer to stay under the cover of darkness, moving away from sources of light. The spiderlings, on the other hand, are drawn towards it. This lures them out of the caves that are already occupied by their parents and into the wider world, where they are carried away by the wind, a process known as ballooning. As they grow and molt, at some point they switch and become light phobic and will seek out darkness again. And so a new spider colonization will occur in other caves, or in this case, tombs. However these spiders got here, it appears they've stumbled across the perfect cave-like habitat in an urban environment. Now that's nature doing what nature does best, adapting to our ever-changing world. love those spiders but I have to say I love cemeteries mm. because you know it may be where we lay our dead to rest but it can be where wildlife thrives and I remember going to Brixton Cemetery and watching foxes I think it's for the really wild show in I don't know 1980 whatever mm. but they really can be fantastic places for wildlife. I think well, many of them have been there certainly since Victorian times so there's been a chance for them to mature in terms of their vegetation um, and equally when people go there they are generally you know revering their mm. dead, they're quiet, and so the wildlife gets some peace and quiet as well, which is great. Um, let's bring you the first of our new nest. It's not a species that's new to Spring Watch, but it's new for this series. Let's go live to our barn owl. In the farm, quite close to our production village, there's a nest box, and we've been watching this barn owl with her clutch of five eggs. Well, on Monday, they started to hatch. And here you can see 
the first of those youngsters emerging. They've been coming out at two-day intervals. There are three of them visible now. And, of course, that asynchronous hatching means that the first one out will be slightly bigger than the second, and so on and so forth. And we've seen this before. So by the time all five have hatched, that's quite a difference in the hatching time and a difference in the size of the youngsters. And sometimes we end up with um, <coughs> one that we call a runt, R-U-N-T. Michaela, you're always rather fond of the runts. Only if the runt survives. <laughs> I like the surviving runts. But we often, don't we, have barn owls and we're watching them every, every spring watch. But we notice something with this pair that we, we haven't seen before and it's this. Not the beginning of this because we see this every time when the male comes in and feeds the female that's brooding. But what we haven't seen before is the male feeding and then mating. And it keeps on doing this with this female when she was on eggs and now that she's got chicks. And we were confused by this. So we asked Mike Toms at BTO and he said that sometimes the females will abandon the chicks and the male and go and find another male to have a second brood. And so maybe the male is doing that to strengthen their bond, but also to make sure that his genes go into the next generation, even if she does fly off and have a second brood. Maybe it would be then his brood. What's unusual though is that typically when birds are copulating, they are fertilising the egg which is already in the oviduct, which is one of the reasons why they have to mate so frequently. Firstly, the inefficiency of avian mating, and secondly, they want to make sure that every egg in the clutch is fertilised. So it is very unusual, that behaviour. Let's move on to our second new nest of the evening. And again, a species we've seen before, but a delightful little bird. Let's go live to our tree creeper. And here, hidden behind the bark of that old oak tree, is our tree creeper live on its little mossy nest, hidden in that crevice. What a bird, look at that. Gorgeous little thing, and there, off it goes. Now, we're not entirely sure how many chicks there are in there at the moment, at least four. We've seen at least four sticking their heads up. And the adults have those lovely recurved bills for reaching beneath the bark to find their invertebrate food. Lots of spiders, there have been plenty of those in. And then they have those stiff little tails that they can rest on like a woodpecker. Once had a tree creeper in the hand, and I can tell you, its tail is really stiff. And there it goes, back into its nest. Now, if you'll recall, when we've had tree creepers on our programmes before, they are quite frequently predated by great spotted woodpeckers. And whilst the team were out today monitoring the tree creeper's nest, they did tell us that there was a great spot in the area. So keep your eyes on this nest. And as you know, you can watch our nest from 10 in the morning until 10 at night. So keep your eyes peeled for action on that tree creeper. You building a little bit of jeopardy. A bit of jeopardy. <laughs> There's always jeopardy with those tree creepers, to be fair. I've got my fingers crossed. But as Chris says, you know, you might see the action before we do, but hopefully they will survive. Right, let's have a look at the cuckoo, because this cuckoo is just being fed and fed and fed and it's getting bigger and bigger and this is the cuckoo that hatched in a meadow pipit's nest that was parasitized by the cuckoo's mum and there it is and yep it's doing well but as I say those parents are busy feeding it like you can't believe they certainly are. Now, what we would like to do is contrast the feeding rate of a meadow pipit's nest with the feeding rate of meadow pipits servicing a single cuckoo. But to do that, we would need our third new nest of the evening, which is a meadow pipit's, pipit's nest. It has four young. Here we are live now at that meadow pipit's nest. And we're able to watch this nest throughout the course of the day. We've seen some activity. They've been coming in at the same time as they've been, other pair has been feeding the cuckoo. And this gives us the capacity, to, as I say, to contrast those feeding rates. Now we know that the cuckoo is great at begging. It's, it's got that massive orange map 
<coughs> excuse me, I think I'd swallowed a fly. <laughs> and for a vegan, that's a crime. <coughs> excuse me. It's got that massive orange mouth and it's constantly calling. But what's the score on the door when it comes to which nest is getting most food? Is it the four regular chicks or is it the cuckoo? Well, here we've got some preliminary data. So we've been measuring the counts at certain hour-long periods. So Tuesday here, between 6 and 7 in the morning, 13 feeds to the meadow pipit, 16 to the cuckoo. At lunchtime on the same day, 11 to 19. And then today, Wednesday, here we've got 6 and 7, 7 to 11, and then eventually it was a draw at lunchtime. But what we're seeing here is a clear trend that the single cuckoo is getting more food than a nest full of regular meadow pipit chicks. And I did some preliminary research today looking through some scientific literature to see if there was any difference that had been recorded previously. There were signs that larger host species, basically bigger birds that could probably take bigger insect prey, led to the more rapid growth of the cuckoo. They were putting on 6.2 grams a day. But then other papers suggested there was no difference at all. So that's something that we will investigate further. And when you join us tomorrow, we're going to be looking at egg mimicry too. Do you know, we've never had a live cuckoo nest on the show before, but we have seen the growth of a cuckoo, haven't we, with a recorded nest. And let me tell you, it's unbelievable how big they get and how much they spill out of those nests. But Chris, I wonder if Megan can tell us, if she was doing a, a feed count, um, who out of the two of us, Megs, which one of us would be the meadow pipit and which one of us would be the cuckoo? Careful. <laughs> Careful, beast. <laughs> Mm, Michaela, there is no question about that. You are, of course, the meadow pipit. Chris is certainly the giant cuckoo. I've seen him at the dinner table and it's not a pretty sight. Now, anyway, moving swiftly on, shall we? Now, of course, I'm still here at Studland Bay in this beautiful coastal landscape. And I've already introduced you to the spiny seahorse. But there's so much biodiversity under the waves that often we don't get to see. And we really should because we don't appreciate our marine environment just as much as we should. Now, we were sent in this amazing footage taken over at Chesil Bay, and this is really gorgeous. It gives us real insights into these animals at night. This is a conger eel there, and we have a lobster. We have to thank Colin a lot for sending us these images. We've got an undulate ray. This is an endangered species. Look at that, gliding along the seafloor. We've got common octopus. Absolutely stunning. You never get to see these kind of shots. We never get to appreciate common cuttlefish there. Common cover, and you look in its mouth, it's consuming something, and then we've got the smooth hound shark. My personal favourite, I'm a big shark fanatic. So to see smooth hound sharks like this swimming at night, oh, it's just so mystical, and I wish I could be under the waves all the time. But I'm stood on the beach, I've got one foot in the water and one foot in the sand, and this is an animal that we actually probably are all a little bit more familiar with. Of course, talking about the marine mammals that are the seals, and they definitely make their home here in Dorset. Now, the UK is really important for seal populations. We are home to 40% of the global population of grey seals and 30% of the global population of the uh, European subspecies of common seal as well. But very sadly, even though the UK is critically important for them, the populations here are still under pressure. Everything from climate change, which increases the frequency of extreme weather events, to changes in their distribution of prey species, meaning they have to travel farther, but then also pollution, plastic getting in, which entangles them, as well as disturbance from people. So in 2014, Dorset Wildlife Trust started the Dorset Seal Project, which was all about two aims. It's about raising awareness for seals and limiting that disruption by promoting a code of conduct asking people not to get within 100 metres of these seals, because ultimately that could cause them to go from their hall sites into the ocean before they were warm enough and ready to do so naturally. So it's really important we give seals the distance. Now, the second thing they did was a photo ID project, so we could understand a little bit more about how seals use the landscape. They asked people to send in images created around Dorset and get them in, because seals have individual markings. It's just like a fingerprint. On their dry and on the beach, and you can see those dark speckles, you can tell which individual is which. And this helps us understand where they're moving and how we can help them. Now, in 2007, a seal pup was rescued in France. Now, this is her. This is Bon Mine, and she is a beautiful female common seal. And she was rescued as a pup in Mont Saint-Michel in France. Now, she was quite spectacular. She was released, and she made quite the epic journey. 
So here we are. She starts down here and she travels 709 miles, not the most effective route, across the channel all the way up to Dorset. Now, in 2007, the year she was actually released, she was seen in Pool Harbour. And I'm really pleased to say that sometimes she can still be found there today. But it wasn't until 2017 when the Dorset Wildlife Trust realised that something might be going on. They were calling her Domino, not realising that she had already been tagged and was known as Bon Min down in France as well. So it's amazing to see them making these gigantic distances, which is more than we could expect. It doesn't happen very often. Typically, seals will only move about 10 to 30 kilometres from their regular haul sites for food. So to see them move like this is really interesting. And we can understand how they're going to do that more in the changing climate. Now, of course, a beautiful marine mammal, gorgeous as they are. I think we should go to a small invertebrate that's less cute and cuddly, a little bit more, well, not more fascinating and interesting, but it's something that makes its lifestyle by turning other things into mulch. Spring is a time when many gardeners start to enjoy the early fruits of their labours. When flowers bloom and the first vegetables of the season begin to grow. And as tender spring greens mature, so arrives the flash and flutter of creamy wings. A large white butterfly eyes up the cabbage patch. As the name suggests, she's bigger than other white butterflies. She's looking for somewhere to lay her eggs. This leaf will do nicely. Large whites lay clutches of up to a hundred jewel-like eggs. And after a few weeks, the caterpillars emerge and they're ravenous. They set to work on the cabbage patch. Their voracious appetite for greens has earned them their colloquial name, cabbage white. But this feeding frenzy also gets them into trouble and not just with frustrated gardeners. The smell of the caterpillar's saliva, when mixed with chewed up leaves, attracts an unwanted guest. Cortesia glomerata, a type of solitary wasp no bigger than a flying ant. She's looking for somewhere to lay her eggs, and to do it, she'll risk life and limb. She pounces on the caterpillar, an opponent many times her size, and takes some deadly blows. But finally, she gets a few uninterrupted seconds to lay her eggs directly into the caterpillar's abdomen. She might not survive, but her job is done. The caterpillar carries on as normal, seemingly unscathed. But as it grows, so too do the wasp larvae. Two weeks later, it's time for them to break out. They release hormones which quieten the caterpillar, freezing it in its tracks. Then, using sharp teeth, they bore holes through the skin. They contract their body in waves, wriggling out segment by segment. When they're almost out, the larvae start to spin a golden silk around themselves. Then, finally, they prize themselves free from their host. 
they haven't spilled a single drop of blood. The caterpillar is still alive, but it's far from free. Its mind has been chemically altered by the wasps, and its instinct now is to serve the offspring. Using its own silk, it reinforces the wasp cocoons. It will now guard its tiny masters day and night, until slowly it starves to death. A few days later, the adult wasps start to emerge. The males appear first, with some of them impatiently waiting for the females. Once they've mated, the females will head off to repeat this cycle all over again. These wasps are so common that by late summer, up to 70% of all large white caterpillars can suffer this fate. So, the next time you curse them for decimating your cabbage patch, remember, it's only the lucky ones that escape this grisly end and make it to the beautiful adult fluttering form. Isn't nature absolutely amazing? Gruesome, but amazing. So welcome back to the Hlin Peninsula. Early in the programme, we were looking at Britain's rarest solitary bee that comes here, well, it exists here only in two sites in all of UK, and they use that habitat, that soft cliffed habitat behind me. Now, there is another species that flies from far afield, migrates from Sahel. This is the sand martin. It comes here to use this habitat as well. Now, this is Europe's smallest hirundine, the group that include the swallows and the house martins. Sand martins will specialize in this habitat. They specialize in steep riverbanks, but they'll also come to these coastal areas, these soft cliffs. And they're the first to arrive in spring of all the hirundines, and they'll, they'll return to these existing nest holes. If they're collapsed or eroded, they'll excavate new ones. Why are they here? Well, they're safe from predators. They can fly in and out of those nest holes. And you can see they're brilliant flyers, very maneuverable. They're able to hover around the nest hole entrance, but they'll also use those amazing flying skills to catch flying insects on the wing. They're brilliant, brilliant little birds. Now, how do you tell the difference between the three species of hirundanes in the UK? The swallows, the house martin, the sand martin. Let's look at them side by side. Now, the swallows are the easier ones. They're larger, they're slimmer, they've got those long tails with streamers. The house martin and the sand martin are a little trickier. They're similar in size, but the house martin have an all white throat, whereas the sand martin has that dark band across the throat, a bit like a collar. And obviously where you see them can be a bit of a clue as well. The habitat is definitely a bit of a clue for that. Now, there are up to 70, well, 70 between, 70,000 breeding pairs and can be over 200,000 breeding pairs a year on year of sand martins in the UK. And that's to do with conditions in their wintering grounds south of the Sahara in the Sahel. But certainly here they have returned and we sent our wildlife cameraman, Steve, to get a closer view of these birds. Now, this was filmed a week ago and the adults were very busy coming in and out of the nest. And we were pretty sure they're well into their breeding season now. We saw them returning with food rather than nesting material. But there was another clue that they have chicks in there, and this is it, leaving with a fecal sac. Now, hungry chicks make a lot of poo, and those fecal sacs coming out again and again, just a real proof that there are chicks in there, that adults taking out the rubbish, doing some housekeeping, making sure those nests are nice and clean and parasite free. Now, really difficult to visualize what's going on inside those nests, but we decided to make the most of the materials available to us here as well. And we've done a little mock-up of what it might look like inside there. So the entrance is over here on the cliff face and they'll excavate a long horizontal straight line tunnel can be as far as 90 centimeters into the cliff face. And at the end of it is a little cavity. And inside that, they'll bring in nesting material, grass, feathers, soft material. And on top of that, they'll lay eggs, much like these ones here, this sort of size. And they'll lay 
typically about five eggs and as many as seven eggs. And it takes from egg laying to fledging 19 to 21 days. So that's pretty fast. It's not the only thing they do fast. Now they have a behavior that is out on full display for people to enjoy. These are fast flies. Now let's take a look at this. Now this is filmed in slow motion. It's six times slower than normal speed. The birds just, you know, cruising past, beautiful. But what I want you to look at is the, are the people in the background, the human world, even the waves are frozen in time. Now, let's rewind that and look at it again. Blink and you'll miss it, so pay attention. This is it in real time. And it absolutely cruised past. It's absolutely amazing. Brilliant, brilliant birds. Now, there is some other behavior that we were sent by wildlife camera operator Chris Beard that we would not see at the beach here. Now, this was filmed over fresh water. This is over the River Usk. And what we saw was a bird over the river, and you'll see it splash down into the river, and that is it, drinking. It's a little bit clumsy. It's certainly not as elegant as the swifts and the swallows do as they skim the surface of the river, but it was quite lovely to see. But Chris also said that he saw a behavior that he hasn't seen before. Now, this was quite unusual. He'd been filming the birds at the nest entrance and he started to notice what looked like a loose formation starting to form, a loose swarm, and they were swirling. He had noticed a gray squirrel, so he suspects the gray squirrel may have startled or spooked the birds away from the nest entrance. And this swirling behavior is not quite a swarm, but it's certainly in other species like bats, it's used to confuse predators and possibly is anti-predatory behavior, which is quite extraordinary. I mean, obviously this is like field craft, field observations and a little bit of speculation. But Chris, I'd be really interested to know if A, you've seen this before and what you make of that. I don't think I've seen them reacting to a squirrel like that, but I do remember as a kid going to a colony that used to be near me, and sometimes in the evening you would get almost like a swift swarm of these birds would come in and they'd all be flying around. I guess they were communicating socially, maybe looking for mates, figuring out who was who, whose nest hole was who, but it's interesting to see that. I mean, of course, we have seen predators at the nest in Minsk. We have. We, we, had, we, we had cameras on San Martins on the bank. They were nesting, as you say, and we saw a stoat that came in and just seemed to take one after another and stash them away. It was like a living larder, wasn't it? It was indeed. Lovely little birds. But how about some local military history? Settle down in your armchair. <laughs> now, in, in 1916, during the First World War, the Navy built a factory a few miles over there on Holt Heath to produce propellant for their shells. And that factory was still operational come the Second World War. And at that stage, of course, many of those sorts of resources were being bombed by the German Luftwaffe, so they wanted to protect it. So what they did was they built an exact replica of that factory over here, a few miles south, on the Isle of Purbeck, away from any human habitation, and they lit it up to look like the actual factory. So that when the German bombers flew in, they mistook the dummy factory for the real one, and on June the 3rd, 1942, they dropped less than, no more than four, uh, sorry, 700 bombs here on the Isle of Purbeck. That is unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. 700 bombs. What's even more unbelievable is nobody was hurt in that attack. But the landscape was permanently scarred with bomb craters. And over time, those bomb craters filled up with water and that attracted wildlife. And now they have 200 ponds in Arn. And at this time of the year, those ponds are filled with real jewels. Jewels like these, dragonflies and damselflies. So this is the emperor dragonfly, a female. And as she goes down to the water, she's laying her eggs just beneath the surface. Look at the colors, they're absolutely exquisite. This is a scarce chaser dragonfly. And again, when you look at the detail of the eye and you look at it in close up. And then on the lilies, we've got a red eye damselfly fly hunting, flying over the lilies, seeing what it can catch. And of course, they're mating at this time of the year. And that's what these are doing. The male is the blue one, the female, the green one. 
and the tail goes over in it, pins the female down behind the head, and then she bends her tail round to reach his reproductive organs. And it, it sort of forms this lovely love heart, and then they mate for, well, 30, 30 minutes plus, isn't it? Indeed, and they fly around in tandem like that. Now, all of those animals are predators, and they're feeding on aerial insects above the surface. But what about the predators that we find in those ponds? Well, I'm pleased to say that Terry Bagley and Howard Inns, two friends of ours, went out today doing a bit of pond dipping, and they found these beauties. Now, what we've got in here are the larvae of Dytiscus, and these are the great water beetle. And I've got one of those over here. I'm just going to push it in here. There it is, resting on the bottom. That's the adult. And these are ferocious predators. These larvae will eat newts, tadpoles, even small fish, as will the adult too. Now, these things will double their size. They're about three centimetres at the moment. By the end of the time as a larvae, they'll get to about six centimetres, and they will bite you. And they're quite curious. Sometimes if you put your finger in, they will come along and have a little nibble. These ones might be... Oh, you're being brave. Yeah, I'm being brave too. Yeah, I know, but that's because you saw me do it earlier. <laughs> and you know that these ones are too small at the moment to, to, to actually bite. But I have been in a pond quite close to here, actually, down uh, there, a couple of kilometres off of RSPBR on the National Trust land. And I've been in the water and these things have been nibbling my legs. Why was I there? Well, because one of my favourite invertebrates lives there. And I returned the other day to try and find it. I first came to this pond 39 years ago. It's a fantastic place for lots of dragonflies, but there is one other animal that lives here, possibly, possibly my favourite invertebrate in the UK. Quite difficult to spot because they rest around the edges of the pond here. And I can see one now. It's resting on the bank. Tricky to see, very well camouflaged, and it needs to be. I'm talking about Dolomedes. Fibriatus, the raft spider. And they are extraordinary spiders, simply sensational. They like these ponds on acid heathland. It's one of their favourite places for them. Now, you can see it's on the bank with its rear limbs resting on that bank, but its forelimbs out touching the surface of the water. And they are equipped with some extraordinarily sensitive hairs that pick up the vibrations of anything. So, if a wasp falls in, or a pond skater skips by, or a dragonfly has an accident, she will skate far better than any Torval and Dean out across the surface of that water and assassinate it. But she's got other tricks up her sleeve. Firstly, these spiders can dive beneath the surface of the water. They're covered in a layer of soft, velvety hairs which trap air. But the favourite thing about this spider, from my perspective, is the fact that they will put those limbs out onto the water and twinkle their toes like this, attracting the attention of small fish like minnows or sticklebacks, which will come up attempt to nibble the spider's feet, at which point it will jump straight through the surface of the water, seize the fish and eat it. Happening here, on Arn, fish-eating spider, sensational. And that's what they do, they just sit there like that, dead static, all day, all night, hunting at night as well, don't need their eyesight, so sensitive to those vibrations. And if anything falls in here now, any foolish fly takes a tumble, it's dead meat on the pond surface. Wonderful. You're so enthusiastic about that, aren't I you? I love Dolomedes. You? And, and, you know, I like the way that you stood on the bank and, and looked at them, but can I just show a photograph? Back in 2003, Chris was in, in that pond doing exactly that creature, those the rather the days, spider. Eh? Those were um, the days. That's when you weren't such a wuss, basically, when you actually got in the water. Well, it wasn't only that. Can I just say, I did it yeah, well, slightly what? later in the summer, and those Dytiscus larvae were quite a bit bigger. And when I was in there, they were nibbling my legs the whole time until they got to the point they nibbled something they shouldn't. That no man wants nibbled by a dytiscus okay. larvae. <laughs> Too much information. I didn't fancy giving it a second go. <laughs> I think
think it's time for a mindful moment, isn't it? Now, spring is obviously a time when you see brilliant sights, beautiful sights, but it's also the time when you can hear fantastic bird song. So settle back and listen to the dawn chorus. Just a stunning, calming bird chorus, definitely worth getting up early for. Right, let's have a final look at some of our live cameras. Let's see which one should we go to. Should we go to our osprey? My favourite nest. I say that about a lot of them, don't I? But no, this is my favourite nest because this has been a successful nest so far. Three chicks doing really well. Uh, can we see the head? Yeah, we can just about see her head there. Oh, is she going to get up? I'm saying she, we can't see whether that's a he or a she. Both Stop of them are it with the osprey. OK, on. go on then. Kestrel. kestrel, quick kestrel. Let's go live to the kestrel. Oh, right up by the camera, posing. Look at that, the James Dean of the bird <laughs> world. Oh, yes. Very, very nice. Quick barn owl, we've got ten seconds of barn owl. And there's our female. Maybe that other egg will hatch tonight. Keep watching the cameras and you might find out before we do. We'll be back tomorrow. This is what we've got coming up. We'll be heading out to Bass Rock to find out how the bird colonies have been doing there. And I'll be on Swanage Pier, sticking my nose in the harsh environment of the rock pools. And I'll be back on the Hleen Peninsula to see some spectacular species that live beneath the waves. And remember, if you want to stay tuned, you can with those live cameras. They're on from 10 in the morning until 10 at night. You'll find them on our website. If you do get out and about, take any videos or photographs, we'd love to see them. Send them into our social media platforms. And tomorrow at 1 o'clock, Hannah Stitfall will be joined by Jack Baddams and Lucy Lapwing to play the Great Tit game. You won't <laughs> want to miss that. Now, who's currently winning the Great Tit game? Don't look smug. You're so smug. <laughs> yes, will Jack or Lucy get enough eggs in the nest and gather enough prey to sustain their future brood? You can find that out at one o'clock with Hannah. Other than that, we'll see you at eight for another Spring Watch. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs> what can we do to help nature and the environment? Well, sometimes big changes come from little actions. The Open University is exploring how simple and effective measures can make a big difference. To get inspired, visit bbc.co.uk slash springwatch and follow the links to the Open University.